One brief anecdote on something that Annie said uh, that is worth, if, you, uh, if you're masochistic or something, have a look at the Treasury's business plan. Have a look at their business plan for the next five years and do a little search for words like equality and climate and green and these sort of things. And you, you don't find them. And, and then go back and look at their business plan for the last five years and have a look at what it said their job was for international climate agreements when, I quote, uh, make sure that international climate talks do not get in the way of UK growth. And that was a specific job that the Treasury had ahead of the Paris Agreement last year. So that's nice, isn't it? Right, this is about Kenya, which is a long way away. Um, and I hope this works okay. This is Kenya. Uh, the reason I'm talking about Kenya is a bit of work that we at the New Economics Foundation with our partners, uh, African Centre for a Green Economy, are actually doing for Catherine and colleagues, looking at uh, how some of these dynamics between inequality and sustainability play out in a few case studies. And you can't possibly hope to capture the diversity of a whole country. So there's four different things we're, four different places that we're looking at, just to start telling a few stories, really. Um, the first is, uh, I'm actually, you know what, Annie, can you press my buttons? Yeah, can you press right for me? Um, so the first is looking at up in Turkana County, which is up in the very north. Um, explain a bit more about that. The second is Mount, if you do it again, you get your arrow. There we are. Mount Kenya in the middle, which is where, very beautiful, biodiverse area where lots of elephants live. Uh, next is Lake Naivasha, which is roughly there-ish, which is where a lot of the flowers come from, a lot of the flowers that you see for sale in UK markets. And the fourth, which I just don't have time to do today, is down at the Tana Delta, which is down here, where this river, the Tana, meets the sea, um, and you've got a lot of agricultural investment. I can tell you some more about that later, maybe, if you're interested, but I had to keep this a bit short. Um, a few sort of headline statistics on Kenya. So a developing country, uh, its GDP has... Uh, doubled in the last, what's that, 45, 46 years. No, it's more than that, isn't it? It's 56 years. Um, and round up, well, something that's been characterised here is the opening up of its economy to foreign investment, a de deliberate strategy of attracting in capital from other countries. Um, but, as you will see, this graph is probably not phenomenally easy to see from the back, this is uh, the share of the income that over the last 20 odd years has gone to different parts of the economy. And the relevant bit is the highest 20% have seen their relative share of the income go up. Um, the highest 10% have seen their share of income go up. The lowest have seen flatlining or even go down at the bottom. So the growth that we're seeing is not closing the inequality gap in Kenya as a whole. In fact, it looks like it's actually exacerbating it. Um, this is the Gini coefficient, the precise measure of which, I don't know, but I'm looking at our two experts here. Um, basically, it's a gap between uh, the, the, the richest and poorest. How much of the income, what is the size of the gap between the very rich and the very poor? Um, I think zero would be good, would it? Yeah, but impossible. Zero would be good, but impossible. If you had zero, it would mean everyone had exactly the same income. So nationally, it's about sort of, you know, 50-50, in the middle-ish. Um, the reason I put this up is just to show that actually different parts of the country have different stories. So actually inequality for most of the places, these are the four examples I had for you earlier, most of these places inequality is lower than national average, but in some places you can see really big spikes. And this is just to draw on Annie's point from earlier, that headline figures can hide really big regional variations. Um, and Kenya is a story primarily of urban versus rural as much as anything else. This is electricity access in the country, where uh, in rural places, basically hardly anyone has access to electricity. In urban places, over 70% of people do. And again, these are the four places we're going to look at Turkana up in the north, where basically nobody has electricity access. And in different parts of the country, it's different. So it's really important when looking. It's one of the reasons why doing a case study approach has been so interesting because it's allowed us to show that national figures really can mask sort of huge variances locally. Uh, right, this is wrong, but this is the World Bank's data. It has a really weird spike in it, and we're checking that. So if you assume that this spike isn't here, but it, is, it appears to be there. But as you will see broadly, this is greenhouse gas emissions in Kenya over the last 45 years, which have getting on for tripled over that time, um, as indeed you know, the world's have. It's been some more positive news on reforestation. Wangari Matai, if people know her, has had a huge uh, reforestation project going on in Kenya, and there have been projects to a more, at a specific regional level 
reforest. So we're just about now getting close-ish back to where we were 25 years ago, which is positive. And that's enough of the boring graphs. Right. So I'm going to talk very briefly about, I will do this briefly, and, and just to stress, this is just capturing some of the things we've learned looking at these three different places. So this is Turkana County, which if you remember is up in the north. It borders Uganda, South Sudan and Ethiopia, which is some of the most sort of contested and violent borderlands in the world. Um, next slide, please, Annie. It um, is a large arid region. It's dominated by nomadic pastoralists, people who move around, uh, very tribal. Uh, it's the part of Kenya that has the least infrastructure investment. People who live there have often said they've been left behind. Really, the, the, of, of all of the parts of Kenya, it's felt to be the place that Nairobi doesn't care about, essentially. Um, and it's been suffering for years from prolonged drought. In 2013, in particular, there's a very serious drought up there, which has seen uh, huge amounts of internal displacement, huge amounts of battles between different tribes as, as the ability to grow pasture, to, 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 to feed crops, uh, to feed, um, what's the word? <laughs> Animals and crops uh, has been under a lot of competition. Um, and there's been border incursions as well where it, you know, people have tried to leave this area to go into other countries and this hasn't gone down particularly well. And climate change is an added factor. And countries like Kenya, where things were already marginal, frankly do not need any climate change going on. But climate, if there are studies linking uh, the increased prevalence of drought in this area to climate change. And conflict results. And something that we've seen time and time again in the studies that we've done is that uh, where you have pressure for resources, where you have limited land, where you have increased population, and you have people who are excluded to varying degrees from power, conflict results. Next slide, thanks. Um, now, things are set to change there because oil has been discovered, majestically, um, which is very early stages. But what we've seen is that communal land, which the tribes that are up in that area have for decades used to graze their livestock on, um, has been privatised, fenced off. People have come along and just found that they can't access that land anymore, which of course has put even more pressure on where people can go um, and where they can make a living. Investment has started to increase. So after years of uh, this being the part of the country that uh, infrastructure investment didn't happen in, unsurprisingly now, the government is building transport schemes and other sorts of investment. And there are more jobs, but they're not particularly well-paid jobs. And something to take away, the central lesson for me from this story, is that uh, the government has said local communities can benefit from 5% of the sales of any of the oil found in that area. But of course, you have to actually own the land in the first place to have that tenure. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of the, if, if, you are, if you lack education, if you are nomadic, you don't necessarily understand your rights. You don't necessarily have access to that tenure. Um, the leaders in the part of the country are taking advantage of the ignorance of the people of Turkana, that's their words. Due to their lack of education, they don't understand their rights. They don't know what a title deed is because they never had it, and that's why they're losing out. So the central lesson from this case study for us is if you're going to develop a country, you have to do it with the people that don't necessarily have access to the land and the rights that you might, that you might expect. Next, please. So another case study we looked at was about elephants. This is an elephant. Um, <laughs> elephants live in Kenya, and indeed quite a lot of them do, 2,500 elephants in Kenya. Um, tourism is a hugely important industry for Kenya as a whole. Uh, safaris, ecotourism, that kind of thing. There's a very strong economic incentive for the national government and for regional governments to preserve wildlife. It brings jobs, it brings investment, about 10% of GDP in Kenya. But across Africa as a whole, biodiversity is decreasing. Kenya is actually decreasing slightly faster than those countries that border it. And one of the problems is the animals and people in an increasingly populated uh, country, its population of Kenya has doubled in the last 35 years, I think. Animals and people do not necessarily always live peacefully side by side, and this is a, quite an interesting tension. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, two and a half thousand elephants in 2,600 in the National Park. And what you've got there is a beautiful, pristine, protected area with great spiritual significance for the people that live in that area, which literally bucked up against one of the most densely populated areas 
in that country. And so that means so do the elephants. It means the elephants are up against the people. And it means that people increasingly find themselves pushing into this protected area. And again, we're seeing the stresses of environmental change. Dry season is lasting longer. The glaciers up in Mount Kenya are depleted, that should say. Um, so there's less water making its way down. The soils are less productive, which is a factor of climate change and of population and the two things coming together. It's estimated there are about 2,000, uh, in well, one study in one year, estimated 2,000 elephant raids on crops, where essentially it's what it sounds like. The elephants just steamroller into crops um, and generally don't even eat them. They just sort of make a mess of them because they're big. Um, and this has a particular impact, as you can imagine, on subsistence farmers who don't have anything in the bank. They rely on the crops to... Uh, to make their livelihoods. There's been protests to the national government where people have said, look, we don't mind the elephants, but could you do something about it to stop them encroaching on our turf, please? And what the farmers have found is that they're of secondary importance, or at least that's what they report. They feel that actually in the national government's eyes, the elephants are more important than the people are. Things are being done about it, and this is something to, a reason to be more cheerful. There are education schemes going on. The government has set up, well, regional government has set up compensation schemes. Local people are now allowed some access to the reserves to, for example, go and forage, find uh, nuts, that sort of thing. A very great initiative called the Mount Kenya Elephant Corridor is actually working with the farmers to say, well, set aside a bit of your land here and a bit of your land here, and what we can do is make a corridor through which the elephants can pass. Uh, you'll have to give that bit up, but it should mean you can plant crops in the rest of it. And this has been reasonably successful, but it points to the central lesson of this case study for us is the need to share the benefits locally of the big economic uh, measures that you're bringing in. So in this case, eco tourism where, or tourism or safaris where lots essentially of rich Western people are coming to your country um, and investing in jobs in that area, <laughs> but where that's not being redistributed enough locally for people to feel that it's theirs and that they have a share in it. And very briefly, the final one um, is Lake Naivasha, which is where the Kenyan... If you've been to a supermarket and you've bought some flowers, particularly if you bought them in December, um, there's quite a high chance you've got them from Kenya. 70% um, of all of Kenya's cut flower exports come from Lake Naivasha, and it contributes something like 2% to the GDP of the country as a whole. So it's a huge industry. Uh, next slide, thank you. Uh, yeah, the population is, is talking to a sort of broader situation of what's going on in Kenya where the population has doubled and freshwater resources in the country have declined by almost half over that time. And so there's a really central question for countries as a whole, like Kenya, have had a square population density and population increases, a new industry, a new draw on natural resources with the fact that those resources are finite and lots of different people have claims on them. Lake Naivasha is... Beautiful. I didn't put a picture of it up, I should have, but it, it, it's uh, flamingos and hippopotami and all of that sort of thing. It's the only freshwater lake in the Rift Valley. And the scale of development there has been extraordinary. It was only in 1982 that the first vegetable farm decided it was going to start cultivating flowers. There are now 100 big farms. You can see inside one of these polytunnels in the background. Massive population boom around the lake. There's now half a million people live in that area. And there's been a huge amount of withdrawal from the lake itself. The experts now fear that by 2035, the thing could be dried up. Not only that, but the runoff, the chemical runoff, the fertilizers are making their way back into the lake. That's harming the biodiversity um, and local people who use it, say, for uh, feeding their livestock. And again, this has resulted in conflict. It's resulted in uh, local people finding that the lands they used to use for years have been fenced off, less access to graze their pastures. And another question here about whose voice is being heard. There are formal agreements around the lake with the different stakeholders, the industry groups, the tourism groups, um, all agreeing what should be done. But the Maasai and the Kikuyu are not really taken into account. They're not having their voice heard. And so the strategies are not being built around giving those guys political power. And of course, if you don't have political power, you can't influence political power. So this is a question from this case study that I think talks to everything that we're looking at here. Inequality and sustainability, is in, they're incredibly complex things. What are you looking at? Carbon or biodiversity or resource use? Or are you looking at economic uh, inequality or wealth inequality and all of these different factors? How do you balance all of those different things? And something that we've heard time and time again from looking at Kenya on the development path that it's on 
is you can't, you have to do them all at once. And what you certainly can't do, if it turns to my last slide, is um, just pursue economic growth alone. It's the same story in Kenya as Annie was talking about earlier. Kenya's economic growth has increased, but its inequality has got worse. Its environmental problems have got worse. And the government's stated objective, uh, very boldly, about 20 years ago, was we'll increase economic growth and that will trickle down across the economy. Well, that hasn't really been seen, which is not to say there aren't benefits, it's not to say there aren't jobs. But the headline figures mask real impacts, real winners, real losers, and impacts on the environment underneath that. There's a central question of rights. So what you're going to do is do both of these things together. What rights are you guaranteeing? I put rights to natural resources in here. So we've seen time and time again in Kenya that some people are given more access than others to natural resources. But that could equally apply to rights to participate, rights to uh, anything else you care to mention. And the final point is more of an economic one, and it talks, I think, to the question that Catherine's going to get you all to think about. Uh, a lot of this has been done in the pursuit of short-term benefit, short-term industrial investment, short-term uh, economic growth. Masking long-term costs, you could end up with one of the, the only freshwater lake in the Rift Valley being dried up in 20 years because of the pursuit of industry. You could end up with local people permanently disenfranchised off their land. Um, so or if you're going to, particularly if you're going to take something as complex as the environment and you're going to take inequality and pursue those together, you have to take a long-term view. You have to take a view of economics that builds in long-term costs, long-term benefits, and allows you to make complicated trade-offs. And the only way you do that is through proper engagement with all of the people that are affected and not just pursuing GDP at all costs. So those are the things we found so far. Um, I think that's...